Digital Foundry is proudly sponsored by the Logitech G935 headset. Often regarded as one of the worst games in the series, Castlevania for Nintendo 64 is, in my opinion, a genuinely good action game. It's a game that hangs well with other titles of this time period and has perhaps received an unfair negative reputation. So today, we're going to walk through the game. I'm going to play it live right here with you guys and discuss it with a good friend of mine who is also passionate about this specific release, my good friend, Audi Surly. Hey, John. Good and glad to be here. Yeah, it's good to have a fellow fan of this game. Now, of course, this is no Symphony of the Night. This is not necessarily one of the best games in the series, and I'm not saying that, but I think it has an undeserved negative reputation. And, you know, it kicks off here with this beautiful introduction. Yeah, the introduction is such a powerful little piece because, as you say, it's very simple. But you see that foreboding structure, the dark Dracula's castle, and then you hear that violin kind of represent the cries and the uh, fear of the people underneath it. And I do think that that kind of brings us into the world of Castlevania in a very uh, proper way. That's right. So let's kind of start with the, there's sort of two areas to come with this from, both in terms of thinking of this game from the perspective of other 3D action games of this era and thinking of it from the perspective of Castlevania. And it's two very different things to explore. So first of all, let's set the stage. Castlevania was released first in America in early 1999, so the end of January. So it seems like a late generation game, but really the Nintendo 64 didn't release until 1996, uh, sort of mid-96. So this was really just three years or so into the life cycle of Nintendo 64, right? But at this time, sort of the 3D action game had been somewhat well-defined, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, but it was still in its infancy. I mean, Tomb Raider came out in 96... It was a very different style of game, but we already had Zelda Ocarina of Time in late uh, 1998. And there were plenty of other titles like this, but I would say, you know, a lot of developers hadn't fully overcome issues with camera management, with uh, smooth controls, or just design in general. So one of the first things that always struck me here about this game is just the, the look of the animation and the character model. So... Uh, yeah, I'm having a little trouble there with the jump. That, <laughs> but that, that's actually that's something we'll discuss momentarily. That's actually kind of important to this game. But uh, so, just the simple move set, running around in this world, you know, jumping, it feels good. His animation actually still holds up surprisingly well today, for the modern era. I think you know it's not a stunning um, thing by today's standards, I guess. But that's not what we're looking at. It's more just like, you can see just running here, he's got fluid movement, we've got nice analog controls, you know. The model is a nice representation of what you would expect from a Castlevania hero of this era. And I actually think it holds up surprisingly well, and it's one of the more fluid 3D character models from this era. Absolutely. So, in that sense, I actually think this compares fairly well. It, it runs smoothly, your character is extremely well animated, it feels good to play. Just the simple act of moving around the environment still feels fluid today. And in some ways, some of the difficulties that people may have had at the time, uh, you know, as we've become used to more complex 3D games, it's no longer that difficult, I feel. In the sense, like, it's pretty obvious how to control it, and it doesn't feel too awkward. But, yeah. But then, so we should probably also talk about the perspective of coming at this from Castlevania. So this was developed, I think, by Konami and Kobe. Uh, so it was a different team than had worked on, I guess, most of the other Castlevania games. But this was a series that, in 1999, had still been reinventing itself regularly. So... Yeah, I mean, you go from the classic first game, which is an action game, and then into Simon's Quest, which is the one I grew up with. And Simon's Quest was very much an exploration adventure game. It was not so much action. And uh, I do think that Simon's Quest is reflected a lot in Castlevania 64. Yeah, absolutely. And including, uh, as we'll see momentarily, there's a day to night cycle in this. Whereas, yes. you know, Simon's Quest announced that through a text box and it was sort of a binary state 
where this is more gradual and it does play into the gameplay as well and this moment right here by the way is kind of neat i think this is a great way to introduce the game and this is an area where you can really see where they used 3d to its benefits because here you can reveal this huge monster this screen filling monster that will come running at you and in the 2d games you couldn't really do this you couldn't create this atmosphere as well yeah and you know I, I feel like, you know, this is one of those games where it actually does harm to compare it to the other Castlevania games. Yeah, I do it's think It's interesting so. to consider from a from study perspective in terms of understanding where they were coming from, but just calling this Castlevania means you're comparing it to those very tightly made 2D action games, where this is something a little different. It's more exploratory, it's more, uh, it's, it's a different style of game, and I think that compared to other 3D action games, again, this does many things better in terms of the actual feel. So yeah, for me, I mean, this game was, uh, we, we mentioned Symphony of the Night all the time, and Symphony of the Night kind of showcases events of Castlevania. You have Alucard versus Dracula, and it's very, for me, it's not, not claustrophobic, but it's, very, uh, it's a very concentrated video game in terms of its lore. Uh, Castlevania 64, however, allows you to kind of look into the world of Castlevania in a different way and explore it. So I always felt like this actually benefited the whole series much more to see how the world around Dracula's castle actually works. Yeah, I think, you know, that's I think that's what they were probably trying to do, sort of flesh out the world of Castlevania. Right. And, you know, in that sense, it has succeeded to a degree. But... Actually, I think the atmosphere in this is one of its strong points. It's very thick. Uh, you mentioned earlier all these, you know, Tomb Raider and other games. And I think Resident Evil as well had a lot to do with how this game came out. That's entirely possible, though. They, it does play decidedly differently than Resident Evil, but... It does, it does make use of more atmosphere and a lot more scary moments than the other that games. That is true, for does. sure. So, yeah, I mean, it's... It is kind of an amalgamation of 3D from that era. This was like this was the state of 3D action games in a sense, and I sus but I do suspect that a lot of the disappointment just comes from how different it is combined with some of its flaws. Like it's not a completely there there are some rough edges here and there, but I still think it holds up better than a lot of other 3D action games from this period. Also, in, just in terms of beyond the actual game design, it's just the technical performance side. I mean, as we can see here, the game runs rather smoothly. Compared to most titles on Nintendo 64, the frame rate here is exceptionally stable. I mean, it targets 30 frames per second. It doesn't always hold it, but you do get there more often than not. And compared to, you know, Ocarina of Time, that was 20 frames per second. And even, at least it was consistent, but there was many other titles, like those from Rare and various other developers on the system that you know, frame rates below 20 FPS were very common. And I feel like they should... It's clear that Konami put a lot of effort into ensuring that the performance in this game would be stable. And I think it pays off. Yeah, it definitely does pay off because this game, more so than, you know, Ocarina of Time and such, this game does put a lot of emphasis on platforming within a 3D world. And having a stable frame rate like this does help those sections. Yeah, absolutely. And here's another thing that's sort of of that era that I kind of miss is uh, it's these kind of simple it's puzzles, if you will. This is almost like the key card dynamic of Doom in a sense, but it's, you know, it's a switch. Tomb Raider did a lot of this, of course, and they do use that here. It's a lot of scenes in this game where you essentially need to hit a switch to open something, and then you have to make your way back to the thing that you just opened. Now, as you, I guess... The combat here is maybe... So the combat's interesting. It's not bad, but um, it's really hard, I'd imagine, to do the whip in 3D. I think they did a commendable job since it's fair, the auto-targeting does work fairly well. And more often than not, the camera system... You see it says normal view there, but it sort of changes dynamically based on the scene to sort of track the player movement. And... Camera management was a very difficult thing during this era, I would say. And this game does it fairly well. I always feel like you ha I have a good view of what I need to see in order to 
make progress, basically. There also is another character to this game, which uh, we haven't mentioned yet, but the two main characters do play very differently. Uh, the other character in the game uh, does have projectiles rather than a whip. That's right, exactly. And then, of course, there would be the third character that was cut that went into Legacy Cornell, of Darkness, which yeah. was released later. So, Cornell. And yeah, it's true. This game is technically, it is somewhat unfinished uh, as a release, but I don't necessarily think it feels that way. Although, between the late release of the game and things like what happened with Legacy of Darkness, it's pretty obvious that there was developmental difficulties during the creation of this Yeah, title. I mean, this game was actually announced back in, I think, April of 97, so you're talking two years uh, back then. That's about a month after Symphony of the Night had already shipped, yes. I believe, in its first region. So, which is interesting, because I actually went back to various magazines of this era, and there is a surprising amount of comparisons to... Symphony of the Night, and the the tone taken by many editorials is typically, well, this Symphony of the Night's just like old 2D, and this is like the real new 3D, and I almost feel like whatever hype was there, combined with the reality, combined with you know people realizing how good Symphony of the Night was, it just set everyone up for disappointment in a way. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was always I, I grew up with uh, Simon's Quest, and for me the exploration part and the lore of Castlevania played much more into how I enjoy them. So I wasn't so disappointed when this game came out. I was actually quite pleasantly surprised that it did play this well and that I got to kind of see this world that I had fallen in love with so much. It, it, it's interesting that you mentioned Simon's Quest there because I kind of think arguably both games uh, sort of spun off from what Simon's Quest attempted. Yes, I do think so. You know, Symphony too. of the Night is like the logical 2D conclusion of those ideas, and I think this is sort of like a 3D attempt at the same thing. Like, Clearly they wanted to make Castlevania a more open-ended experience. They just hadn't fully figured it out yet. And in a way, I actually think this, this is a more interesting game than what uh, Igarashi would do on the PlayStation 2 oh, absolutely. years later. Oh, absolutely. I do agree with that. Like, those games play very well, but they're pretty they're pretty dull. linear. I mean, this game is linear as well, but within that linearity, there's a lot of exploration. Uh, but see, li linear, I like. I'm not a. I'm. That's not the problem. The issue with those games is that they essentially were, they almost designed a 2D map from above, in terms of figuring out, um, how to lay out the stages, and then it was just a collection of like, square or rectangular right. rooms and yeah. hallways. And you, you would just run through these very samey looking environments. It didn't feel like a world. It just felt like a collection of rooms. Uh, and that was it. It was pretty dull in that sense. Where this does feel like properly constructed levels. I mean, here it's outdoors, but you do get into the castle. And there's a puzzle elements in there. It's a very different layout. It's very adventurous and it works. And also note the camera work here is pretty good, I think. Yeah, it does dynamically change. And I do think that that's very interesting how they made different camera systems to assist you in different types of situations. And there's some lore for you. There is some lore. And here, yeah, this is a perfect example of just kind of, it's not much, but it's a little text dialogue that gives you a little bit of a glimpse into the world of Castlevania. Also, uh, this, this platforming, there is actually a challenge to it. You have to be... Like that, see? I, I have failed. Now, some might argue that's a bad thing, but it's it's an interesting thing to think about um, in the sense that modern platforming and modern uh, traversal... Traversal is a very common thing in action games today, but it's so automated now. Yeah. So, you know, I'm thinking like Uncharted. Like, you basically jump onto predefined points and you hold a direction and you just tap the X button to move along. So I, I kind of miss challenging 3D platforming in a way like this. And this is something, obviously, that Tomb Raider excelled at as well. Uh, it works pretty well here. You really have to think and take care every time you make a jump. So every jump is important. And it can't, you know, it, if you're not careful, it could feel somewhat annoying, I suppose, at times. And you could argue that it's not as tight as it should be. But I think it's tight enough that it actually works, and that's something that plays into this game a lot. There's a lot of jumping and climbing that you will do, and it's not um, it's not trivial. Like, this is fairly simple, but if you rush this, you're going to fall into that water. 
then yeah the camera angle is a little odd like it's not bad there like but you do you still have to have a, a nice spatial awareness it's the kind of thing that actually works really well in vr Oof, so i made that so i have to be really careful this game is fairly challenging actually there you go and a lot of times it does have to do with this platforming but it feels good somehow when you execute it like if this was an uncharted kind of experience you there wouldn't be any tension here you would just be holding up and tapping x and you would reach the top and thus there's not really any platforming or climbing that's also missing in modern tomb raider games and that's what tomb raider was built on so but again that's not you know that's very different for Castlevania, isn't it? So I could see why some folks might be disappointed by that. There's, of course, we haven't mentioned the torches yet, of which there are many. You know, there's lanterns that are physically placed on the ground. That is, of course, straight Castlevania. There's also, I guess that's not technically wall meat anymore, but it sure seems like no, it. No, I guess there, yeah, it's more like, Pillar meat? Pillar, yeah, I it's guess. pillar meat instead. Yeah. So, yeah, this is this is pretty interesting to see. That. You can see it's dusk, I guess, right now. Yeah. I do think that the day and night cycle has a similar effect from Simon's Quest in this game, and that at night time, things get a little bit more difficult. Exactly. Oh, that guy's gonna explode. So... Um, There's some very nice lighting effects in this game as well. Absolutely. And I should note, you know, for, for anybody watching, of course, that I am playing this on real N64 hardware. Uh, and I am watching John playing. Yes, yeah, so I'm using the N N e or sorry, N64 RGB on there with the D-Blur enabled. But I do get a little bit of interference through the OSSC that's not visible in the CRT that I need to figure out. But either way, this is, this is accurate to the game running on real hardware, obviously. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I really do like, I still like the way this looks somehow. It's just... I think this is really a beautiful game for the N64. I mean, it has a lot of color usage as well. It's not as blandly. I, I think a lot of N64 games at the time were kind of bland in its color use. And this one has really deep blues and the dark reds that I kind of like. Well, you know, that that was definitely a strength of... Nintendo's first-party games tended to be great in that regard, but it was hit or miss on the third-party side. Of course, there there weren't many titles like this on uh, the PlayStation, I would say, for better or for worse. I mean, you could say, I guess, Callisto's Nightmare Creatures. <laughs> Yeah, but that that's a great example of a game that feels extremely jerky in motion. Uh, they even released Nightmare Creatures Two on the Dreamcast, and that game feels worse to play than this by a wide margin, with very stiff animation, and it's just it doesn't feel nice to play. Now, speaking of Dreamcast, I do believe that there was another 3D Castlevania announced right. for Dreamcast. Resurrection, Castlevania Resurrection. It was an American-developed game, uh, and it would have... But, so this released in 1999, so Resurrection was a known thing at that point. Whoa. Whoa. Well, that was that was bad. So I like I actually like this game over screen, by the way. It's kind of a nice with the violin there and the, the branches from the trees waving the shadows there. Yeah, and I do remember that getting a game over in Symphony of the Night was not as fun. Well, you did you did get that awesome game over screen. Yeah, but also the awesome loading screens and times. No, that's not that bad. And I don't think we should be harsh on Symphony of the Night in that sense because it it is a extremely well designed game. Oh, absolutely. And it, and it came out two years prior to this as well. Uh, that you know, at the time, remember, I mean, 3D was what everybody was arguing in favor of. 2D was on the way out. Yeah, especially with Sony. I mean, they didn't even really want too many 2D games on their console. Exactly. So, I mean, we did end up with a decent number of them anyways. But That is true. Yeah. N64, though, was... I mean, you say especially Sony, but 
there was a lot of 2D on the PlayStation. Whereas if you look at Nintendo 64, there is basically none. There's like a less than 10 titles. There was yeah, there was the Treasure One, uh, Mischief Makers. Yeah, but that's not even fully 2D. It know? plays like it's, a 2D game. It oh. does, but that's what I mean. There's not like. 2D pixel art style games on Nintendo 64. No, I mean Not Konami really. did make Konami on the N64 did make that fighting game Rakuga Kids, which I do oh, believe yeah. is a 2D game. And there's also a Magical Tetris Challenge. That is true. Which, One of my favorite it's games. It's not on a console. side scroller. It's a great game and it's beautiful 2D uh, sprite work in there. Look at that nice sprite statue there. It's a nice 2D bitmap. I mean, Konami mm. had, really had a thing of making these atmospheric uh, adventures on the N64, because shortly after this, we got Hybrid Heaven. That's true, and I actually think this is better than that game. I think it's a much better game. And curiously, though, that actually had... So I had suggested that Castlevania would have been better off if it didn't necessarily share the Castlevania name, in a sense, in terms of the marketing. But Hybrid Heaven, despite having a, an original name and premise... A lot of people seemingly compared it, or thought of it as a Metal Gear Solid for N64. I do remember that, yeah. Even the magazine. That was the thing, yeah. yeah. And it very clearly was not intended to be that, per no. se. And um, I think that actually kind of hurt the game. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's not. I don't think it's a great game, but it's, you know... It is... It's very interesting to me to see which games end up with a bad reputation over time and which ones don't. Like, I really don't think that this is worthy of the, the such negative reactions that it's received, basically. <gasps> hmm. Is that... I can't really get over there. Oh, I think you have to climb down. But why? What's down here? Oh, there's that down there okay let's make our way down there yeah so this is I have to give props to people that do streaming all the time so this is this isn't a stream but I'm kind of treating it like one yeah this is an experiment for us both so exactly so this is you know this is not a typical full DF retro episode it's just sort of an extra thing it's a game I randomly felt like talking about just uh, prior to E3, of all things. Maybe we'll see something Castlevania there? Probably not. <laughs> you never know. I mean, uh, what was the last Castlevania game at this point? Um, That's a really good question, actually. Would it be Lord of Shadow 2? It might be. Now, um, that, that actually brings up an interesting question to you. How do you feel that this compares to Lords of Shadow, being that they're both, like, a 3D imagining of Castlevania? Um, I kind of put them on similar uh, footing in a way. I like them both. Lords of Shadow also received... Uh, that game really does the journey thing well, as well, where you go through so many different places. Like, it takes... I think you don't even get get close to Dracula's castle until like 15 hours in and it's just you visit so many weird places but it feels so different and that's okay it's its own thing and so yeah I guess I kind of put these on similar tier it's a little bit more combat focused but uh, it works for me and this this definitely works as well Uh, let's see. So I threw that switch. But this door didn't open. I don't recall what that did. And that's part of the fun, actually. That's something else, you know. Uh, I actually kind of miss the feeling. So I haven't played this since 2014, I guess. So it's very random that I decided to pick it up now. I have not played this in yeah well over 10 years. So, But this moment here... Um, so... I have a, you know, I know the kind of thing that I need to do, but I don't exactly have an immediate idea of like, okay, there's no big arrow saying go this way. And I kind of appreciate that because it lets you sort of fall into the world a bit more, sort of explore and, you know, like, okay, what did I miss? What thing do I need to hit or collect? 
Um, so wait, I hit that switch. So maybe I triggered something over there. Nice automatic camera there as well. So that's that's fun to me. I, I like figuring out where to go somewhat with, without the guidance. And that's something that a lot of early 3D games have that I kind of find rather uh, interesting and enjoyable. It's just that sense of you don't know where to go. You just have to figure it out. And it's often not that complex or anything, but it's like a short, simple thing that you need to figure out to proceed. And over time, that adds up. And that's kind of a, you know, I do think that's why From Software has really struck a chord with people, uh, is that their games do still have this kind of thing going on, if you will. Where it's like, you're thrust into a world, you're not explicitly told where to go or what to do, and it's just like, just figuring that out is, is part of the fun. Yeah, this game does really uh, value and reward exploration. So, of course, I'm going to have my roasted beef there, which is, of course, delicious. It's not as good as wall meat from other Castlevania games, but it, it'll do. Oh, was this open before? I can't recall. I don't think so. I think you're right. This is new. Got a bomb chicken behind me. More pillar meat. Mm, pillar meat. Oh, there's a switch. You gotta mention though that this is not pork chops. These are actually roast beef. That's true. The superior product. Yeah, this N64 really has a has a unique look to it. That's decidedly N64. So this was uh, this system specifically was the first time I really had an encounter with real time uh, texture filtering where it essentially averages pixels around to sort of blur it and interpolate the pixels to create sort of a smoother looking texture. And I actually think N64 does... So it's it reminds me of, and it makes sense, that, that early silicon graphics look. If you look at a lot of old CGI, you have a lot of these like blurry but filtered looking textures. And while well, obviously the detail level here is much lower, it does remind me of that in a way. Let's see, did that that open the that gate? Open the gates, and now we can continue. See, it was a moment of figuring out where to go, but there we go. Got these save crystals here. Quickly saved, and then continue. Let's see what's up here. I suspect a boss. Did we mention yet that the Japanese version of this game? actually saved to the cartridge, whereas the Western version saved to the memory card. That's right. That was a, um, a, a strange change, actually, between the two. So the motorcycle skeletons here, which is probably the most popular part of the game today, it's just this weird design. Yeah, you're right. It's pretty, it's pretty great. So we're getting a little bit of slowdown here, but it's not too bad. I like that slide. Skeleton. So the camera during this battle is interesting. It, it focuses nicely on the boss. Um, but obviously you lose peripheral vision on, on other enemies around you. But due to the auto lock-on system, it still manages to work fairly well. Family jewels there. It's really spawning a lot of skeletons. Yeah, had to feed them quickly. So yeah, there's some uh, gonna... some slowdown here actually. Yeah, it's not too bad, but it is happening. I may need to enjoy some pillar meat shortly. Should probably do that. Yeah. Really haven't done many let's plays quite like this. So this is a this is a different experience. Yeah, we should do more so we get better at them. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. There we go. Well, you really have to be aggressive on this guy in terms of just like if you let off of him. Yeah, there you, we have go. To, you have to hit him three three times in order to get some of his energy down. Then he changes cycles. And he runs over there and he starts hammering the ground. Yeah. You can see he's actually falling apart as well. He's losing limbs. That is cool. <laughs> so yeah, this first level then, it's it's pretty solid, I think, in terms of what, what it presents to the player. Good atmosphere build up. You you learn about the time of day cycle. Uh, you get a taste of combat and platforming. You see how the camera system works. At this point, there's nothing really... I w it's hard to say that this is a flawed game compared to other action platformers on the system. No, I definitely do think that it does definitely achieve what it sets out to do, and that is to make a interesting adventure game. Oh, that's cool. See, now he's down on the ground. Yeah. So yeah, like, there he goes. He's down. There's actually collision on him. That's cool. That's, that's actually kind of a... I'm a little surprised. Usually there's large character models in games, especially games from this era. They basically disable... The, there's not really collision once the corpse goes down. Well, I guess the skeleton in this case. You just run right through it, you clip through it. But here, you actually get stuck on it. It's a little cutscene here, opening the drawbridge to go inside. Those nice chains there rendered with the texture. That's competent looking for N64. I really do love his character model, though. I really think it works great. It's very low poly, but uh, the design, they, they do a lot with very little. These super low detail characters. Up close, they look a little bit strange, but from a distance, from the normal play distance with the low resolution, holds up really well. So that's kind of a nice cinematic pan out of the camera there. Nice save crystal waiting for us. I guess the save crystal concept is also very of this era where you have an actual save point. <laughs> These days it's more about checkpoints between different areas. Do you prefer that though? Um, it depends on the game. I actually don't mind this setup so <laughs> much. But checkpoints work too, it just depends on where they're placed. I do, I actually like having to replay sections because it forces you to learn it. Oh, night, this is, I love the stairs here. Because <laughs> it's just a, it's a flat texture. But they, they've convincingly modeled, or they've convincingly textured it in such a way, it does kind of look 3D. I think. It is. I think it's just a flat texture. It looks it like looks it. It looks like it, yeah. Yeah. It's just it's very very clever use of, of sh shadow and baking into the asset there. So, okay, now we're indoors and we have to do a little bit of a tower climb. So we get some enemies to deal with. So familiar enemies. Oh, it's the... Yeah, like that. That's the, uh, the skull pillar thing. Whoa. Oh, I jumped onto this area. A sun card. The DSS system from Castlevania Circle of the Moon. Pretty <laughs> much. Not the best. So, or, yes, I, so I like this change. We went from the wide open outdoors to, like, so we're sort of climbing a rather tall tower, I believe. Uh, it's... You can't even see all the way up there. N64 fog. So, I guess one other thing I just wanted to kind of mention I'll kind of slide this in here is the music so uh, we haven't talked too much about the music and that's kind of a highlight of this game I think especially considering the limited uh, hardware on the N64 for handling music I mean there was some amazing drivers written and stuff like musics uh, from Chris Hulsbeck but yeah so 
first of all, like in this room here, if I just uh, let the music play for a moment. That sounds pretty good, but let me insert a few different tracks here just so those watching this video so you can hear some of the different sounds you will hear during this game and kind of see that I think at least that this does sound better than your typical Nintendo 64 title, both in terms of the actual implementation and of course the compositions themselves. So here's a few demo tracks. So yeah, that's that's kind of the music, I guess. What's the, what's the trick here? I forget. Just whip these guys. Let's see. Whoa. Does seem to be doing damage at least. So yeah, I guess um, this weird experimental video. Uh, Hopefully you guys found it somewhat interesting. It's more of a casual Let's Play podcast-ish sort of experience. Uh, sort of a look at this game. And if you if you really want to know more about Castlevania on N64, or maybe 3D Castlevanias in general, let me know and maybe we'll do a proper episode on it as well. But for now, it's kind of a fun way to spend some time. So thanks for joining me on this Audi. Oh, thanks for letting me join this experiment. I hope uh, we get to do it again. Absolutely. And if you guys enjoyed this video, as always, be sure to like and subscribe, ring the notification bell at the top, and of course, follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, this is John and Audi signing off. Featuring 2.4 GHz wireless, 50mm Pro-G audio drivers, and DTS Headphone X 2.0 surround sound technology under the hood, the G935 headset delivers the ultimate wireless audio solution for gamers, whether you're playing on PC, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, or mobile. Order yours today from Logitech G.